Chair Baldwin, thank all of you for being here. And uh, Dr. Baltagnoli, it's good to see you. Thank you for being here today, but also uh, congratulations on your fairly new role uh, as NIH director. I also want to thank you, as you know, for coming to West Virginia in March to see firsthand all of the amazing things uh, that we are doing at West Virginia University, including seeing the work that Dr. Rezai and his team are doing to combat Alzheimer's disease and addiction. As you witnessed, my home state of West Virginia is a rural state, that some of the highest, but we have some of the highest rates of uh, health challenges in the country. A partnership with NIH is critical for us to make improvements. Dr. Volkoff, who has also visited West Virginia, and Dr. Hodes, who says he's, he's coming. We're getting, we just got to get the date, right? Um, Dr. Rothmel and uh, Dr. Marazzo, it's wonderful. And Dr. Gibbons, thank you for being here today uh, to discuss the many important health issues facing our nation. Many of you, uh, as I said, have visited or will visit, and I'm very grateful for that. This will be a challenging funding year, as Chair Baldwin uh, aligned that out. But for me, biomedical research at NIH is a priority for me and has been for this long bicameral bipartisan priorities as well. The budget proposes $49.8 billion in funding for NIH, including 21st Century Cures and ARPA-H. The budget also proposes an additional $1.5 billion in mandatory funding, funding for the cancer mood shot. Last year, I was proud we were at least able to get an increase of $300 million in very tough headwinds in discretionary spending for NIH. NIH is not just a great research and biomedical research institution. It's also an economic, uh, a driver of economic growth, funding more than $92.89 billion in national economic activity across the nation in 2023. My small state of West Virginia, NIH supports 759 jobs and $148 million in economic impact in 2023 alone. And this is in a state that we really don't see, uh, too many don't see us as one of the areas for medical innovation, but we are proving the nation wrong every day. The NIH impacts every American in some way, and I hope to again work in a bipartisan way to fund our joint priorities, such as finding cures and treatments for cancer, Parkinson's, ALS, Alzheimer's disease, and many other conditions that plague Americans. As I mentioned, Dr. Bartagnoli, I'll get it there someday, <laughs> joined me at, with a name like Capito that gets mispronounced as Capito half the time. You'd think I would be better at this. I'm trying, I'm trying. She joined me at WVU and witnessed the innovative research, talented research and advancements that we are doing in West Virginia. Much of this has been made possible by the partnerships that have been fostered by NIH over the years. Researchers throughout our state are making significant contributions to biomedical research in areas ranging from cancer to Alzheimer's disease to substance use disorders. Unfortunately, West Virginia continues to rank above the national average, both in new cancer diagnoses and deaths. So I'm pleased that the budget devotes increases to finding cures and treatments for cancer. As a lead sponsor of the Childhood Cancer STAR Act, I look forward to hearing about your priorities and advancements to combat cancer and grow our clinical trial networks, especially among our children. I will continue to uh, prioritize fostering NIH collaboration with smaller and more rural states. Last year, we were able to provide a modest increase for the NIH IDEA program. This program provides funding to 23 states, including mine, that historically received very little federal research funding. And I'm proud of the friendship and partnership with Dr. John Lorsch at NIH for his leadership. The IDEA program and the other NIH funding has been instrumental for Marshall University, WVU, and other institutions in the state in developing world-class research in neuroscience, cancer, stroke, vision, and addiction science. Dr. Bautrignola was able to hear about West Virginia Clinical and Translational Science Institute's new mobile unit named Maverick, purchased thanks to an NIH grant. Dr. Sally Hodder and her team will use this mobile unit to give individuals all over the state, we know access is the issue in rural, in rural states, the ability to participate in clinical trials for new treatments and as a prime example of how NIH investments can directly affect people. I do want to take uh, a moment, and uh, the chair and I are on like-minded here, to express my disappointment that the uh, proposed NIH budget does not devote new resources specifically for Alzheimer's disease research at NIH. I have personally seen close hand through both of my parents the devastating 
uh, effects that Alzheimer's can have on the pam family, the patient, and the caregivers. Nearly 7 million Americans are currently living with Alzheimer's in our country, and the national cost of caring for those with Alzheimer's and other dementias is, is estimated to reach $360 billion this year. That's staggering. Alzheimer's and dementia-related research must remain a national priority. I'd also like to see more attention devoted to substance abuse. The National Institute on Drug Abuse receives only a nominal increase in this budget. Dr. Volkoff has visited my state, as I mentioned, and she's seen firsthand how West Virginia is in the crosshairs, and as we know, every state is in the crosshairs of opioid and addiction crisis. I would like to add my voice in agreement with the chair on uh, the, rec uh, the recovery uh, program for those with long COVID, and I know we have uh, many in the audience today. I know we're dealing with a tough funding situation this year, but investments in biomedical research are so important for the future of our country. Before I close, I would like to address Dr. Bertignola again on something that we learned last week. I want to comment on something um, that was is concerning. For years, the NIH and its leadership has taken the stance that NIH-funded gain-of-function fun research was not happening with Echo Health Alliance or the Wuhan Institute of Virology in China. This appears to be false based on Dr. Tabak's response to a House committee last week when asked if NIH grant uh, funded gain-of-function research at, Wu at, at Wuhan. Dr. Tabak answered, quote, if you're speaking about the generic term, yes, we did, end quote. Last year, HHS barred, debarred the, the Wuhan Institute from receiving federal grants for 10 years and just last week suspended all funding for Echo Health Alliance and plans to debar them too. I think both of those should have probably been done much sooner. The NIH has a credibility problem here when it comes to gain-of-function research, and I strongly encourage you and Dr. Morazzo to, in your, uh, in your new roles, to restore strength uh, and research uh, integrity uh, and trust to the NIH in this area. Thank you very much. Look forward to your testimony.